Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined here today at the John Hope Franklin Center by Professor Margot Natalie Crawford, who's a professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of the new book, Black Post-Blackness, The Black Arts Movement in 21st Century Aesthetics. How are you doing today, I'm Margo? good. I'm glad to be back on Left of Black. Well, we're glad <laughs> to have you. Um, this is an amazing book. Um, and, and I'll start just with the archive that you're working with and how dense it is and your comfort seemingly um, with both very prominent texts that we know and also some more obscure stuff. Mm -hmm. It suggests to me that you have a deeper relationship with the black arts movement. So, so tell me about your relationship with the black. Th this doesn't strike me as a researcher going, this is something I want to study. It seems a little bit more right. personal. It is, it really is. So for me, I think in terms of that deeper connection with the black arts movement, it's partially Chicago growing up in High Park when my father and my mother, I should say, um, would often recall um, throughout the years, so to speak, their deep roots in the black arts movement. So I think in some way I would have to place it there. I would have to say my desire to go deep with the black arts movement is related to that type of family immersion, growing up, uh, knowing Haki Matabuti, yeah. right? You know, having those personal connections, yeah. knowing um, Bobby Sinsack, knowing so many people, so many artists involved yeah. in the Chicago Black Arts Movement. Was, a, was there a part of you who wanted to protect that legacy? Honestly, it's not so much to protect a legacy. I think it's to fight the madness that I think is still happening sometimes when people flatten the black arts movement, when people actually almost make a caricature of it, yeah. you know, wanting yeah. Yeah. to somehow make these claims about black experimentalism, for example, as something that comes after the black arts movement. And so this book, Black Pulse Blackness, is really pushing against a certain way that we understand the tradition of black experimentalism. As I try to show how, how complicated the black arts movement was, I wanted to really unveil how deeply experimental this yeah. movement was. Because part of what we get, right, we get a sense looking back that it was static, that, right. that somehow that right. black arts uh, artists from that period had come to a space and they stayed there. Right. And that they intended to come to that right. space in their state as opposed to mm -hmm. something that was much more something much more of a process. Absolutely. Yeah. And honestly, that's why I wanted to focus on the second wave of the black arts movement in a way that I think um, we hadn't done before. I wanted to focus on the 1970s, what I call the 1970s second wave of right. the black arts movement, because that's when we know the movement wasn't static. Right. Post that's Baraka, when we see, right. that's right, but not even, I would say, honestly, Mark, not even just post Baraka. I mean, as the movement is, as Nikki Giovanni says in the poem, we, screeching to a halt. Right. So this is one of those 1970 right. poems, right, that make right. us think about this idea, this notion that I'm proclaiming we need to call it and recognize it another wave, a second wave of the black arts movement. So as the movement is screeching to a halt, if we go back to your sense, and I agree entirely that there's nothing static about the movement, right. the movement is screeching to a halt and people are in motion. People are realizing clearly we are uh, in this movement still claiming blackness and also at the same time, the simultaneity of claiming that blackness and also knowing that that blackness in and of itself is also that move beyond blackness. Right. You know, hence black post-blackness, something that unwieldy and that dynamic as that kind of motion. Whatever blackness is, it doesn't stay still. You talk about yeah. a politics of anticipation. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that, that really what's at the, the root of the black aesthetics in this period of time right, right. are folks anticipating what the next move might be. Absolutely. Without knowing what yeah. it is, right. without being comfortable with it, without right. knowing where it's going to take you. Right. Um, that is a fraught relationship for some artists. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a fraught relationship for the people, if you will. 
right. right, who want to be able to grab onto an aesthetic that is right. there. They, they want it there, mm -hmm. there. Talk about mm -hmm. that tension between artists wanting to go beyond right, right the right. static and, and audiences wanting a there that they can claim and, and right. put their hands in and, and stick their teeth in. Absolutely. I think anticipation does shape, I think, black aesthetics as a whole. And I think in the black arts movement, it's so heightened during this second wave, the 1970s wave of the black arts movement. And I think one way to think about even that notion of anticipation would be Ed Bullen's deeply experimental play, There is Blackness, right. such a short play, right? When the uh, announcer appears on the stage and says, I will now announce blackness. And there's that anticipation for 20 minutes. The audience sits in silence for 20 <laughs> minutes and blackness <laughs> never appears. And so I think it's really interesting to think about the second wave of the black arts movement as pivoting on abstraction and anticipation. More satire emerges during right. the second wave of the black right. arts movement as right. well. What I also want to call black public interiority, as you know, in one of the chapters, this right. notion that then there's, move, there's a move not just to the sense that the movement is deeply this black mirror stage and it's about the black um, interior, but also there's a way that people, as they try to figure out during the second wave mm -hmm. of the movement, mm -hmm. how the black interior can be shared. How do you create black public interiority? Right. So there's a way that the second wave of the black arts movement, I think, allows many of the artists to actually anticipate how complicated, right, yeah. this notion of black aesthetics is. And, I mean, you, you talk about, you yeah. know, what the black book looks like in the 1970s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. This idea of a really public, rigorous space of blackness, right. but it's intended for private black consumption. Right. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. and it's interesting because, you know, what we deal with now, and I use Ta-Nehisi Coates as just one right. example, mm -hmm. uh, that's not how writers are necessarily processing their work now, right? That right. The work now is about getting the widest audience mm -hmm. possible, mm -hmm. telling black stories to a larger audience. But for the black arts movement, it was a very right. different kind of right. uh, tension they were facing. We want to be able to right. write publicly, to be able to reach as many people as possible, but it's for private black consumption. Right, that we still, that's right, I think in the movement they were thinking, we want that wide audience, wide black audience, but I also think wide audience at large, and at the same time, we dream of this black interiority that would not be lost in that process right. of gaining right. that larger audience. Right. Uh, you talk about how, particularly in this moment, that the black arts movement gets misread. Right. Um, and, and black artists, contemporary black artists, like in Claudia Rankin mm -hmm. in particular, mm -hmm. how they're referencing that this continuum of the right. black arts movement gets misread. Right. So you talk about the cover of Citizen. Mm -hmm. um, and the Hammonds piece, you know, right. uh, from the hood or yes, in the hood, in the hood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a hoodie, right? <laughs> right. right. It's done in 1993, and mm -hmm. all of the commentators who see Rankin's book right. and see the cover art, and the only thing they can process is Trayvon Martin. Right, right. No, that's yeah. right. And that sense that it's, I think, a wonderful way to think about how, then, you know, if we if we do. Think about David Hammonds then as one of the many artists who we would say, I would say really on the edge of the black arts movement as the black arts movement is unfolding. David Hammonds is someone who is so tied to black abstraction right. and in a way that's so fascinating for me, uh, really leads us to understand the black abstraction, the role black abstraction right. played in the black arts movement. So when David Hammonds talks about Mel Edwards' work as being the first time he, David Hammonds, realized that art could be black and, and abstract. abstract. What I'm getting at is this is what we should hold on to when we think about that cover of Citizen. We okay. should think, I also um, propose, we should think about the power of black abstraction, right? What I want to call, what I call in this book, strategic abstraction. Mm -hmm. Not strategic essentialism, but strategic, strategic black okay. abstraction. Uh, yeah. Philip Ryan Harper in his new book yes. on, on black mm -hmm. abstraction, and he, he talks about you know music as almost being kind of ground zero for, for black abstract expression. Right. Right. Um, you talk about the, the counter publics and, right. and, and counter knowledge right. that's produced in terms of mixed black media. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, and mm -hmm. we're in a moment where the text as the book is privileged, 
Right. Music as a kind of extension of black oral culture has mm -hmm. always been privileged. Mm -hmm. um, you're making a particular claim on the combination of textual mm -hmm. culture and visual art. Right. No, and I do, I think it matters that when we think about Glenn Ligon, for example, that he's giving us the word and image text, right. interplays right. as a way of understanding black abstraction. Right. I do think that's a way also of understanding my core argument in black post-blackness that there's a real continuum between the abstraction in the black arts movement and 21st century visual art black abstraction because the word and image interplays also abound in the black arts movement. And so I do think there's a fascinating way to compare Edward Christmas's painting of Baraka's poem SOS on the wall of respect and the way that the words fade and we lead to the illegible, illegible um, pardon me, uh, painted poem in a way that we can really compare that to Glenn Ligon's mm -hmm. word paintings that also pivot on this notion of the frustrated reading. What do you think fueled the black arts generation, their desire to really push towards experimentalism and abstraction? Right. Um, was it just simply the desire to break out of the constraints mm -hmm. of, of racialized blackness as it was experienced in the United States? Um, was it that mm -hmm. sense of pursuit of a freedom, you know, in the arts and otherwise that they might not have had access to, previous generations right. might not have had access to? Right. I, I think it's so tied to what we hear even in Amos Moore's poem, Poem to the Hip Generation, and you'll love this because it's really a poem, I think, Mark, that performs scat is the answer, because he gives us in yeah. this poem, poem to the hip generation, those repeated questions, who are we, where are we going, what are we here for, and it's repeated, who are we, where are we going, what are we here for, and then he gives us dee da da do, dee da dee da, something like that, that's my bad scatting. Scat is literally the answer when you right. think about what it's, you're it's asking. It's a placeholder. Right? That's it's right. a placeholder to right. whatever this is going to become. <laughs> right. right. And so when you ask that question, during the black arts movement, yeah. Why are they drawn to experimentalism, right? I think it makes me want to think about this poet, this poet who Amiri Baraka said in one of the interviews I did with him, he said that Amos Moore, in his mind, um, the most important poet of the movement, and he's so unknown. So Amos Moore, those questions, who are we, where are we going, what are we here for, I think that's the answer or the questions we need to think about as we lean into scat is the answer. Why were they drawn to experimentalism? They were literally trying to figure out who are we, where are we yeah. going, what are we here for? <laughs> right, so it was, it was that heavy, this sense of what will blackness be? Right. They knew that the only answer would be the experimental, would be the scat. So take, take us yeah. now to the 21st century, yes. right? What artists are asking that question now, what will blackness be? Right. Who will we become? Right. Um, Absolutely. So much of our culture, even with this kind of push towards Afrofuturism, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. seems so present mm -hmm. at the moment. So, mm -hmm. so, who are really asking these questions about what blackness is? Well, you know what I argue. Become? What I argue in black post blackness is that there's a real way to actually make these connections between the black arts movement experimental texts and right. texts like Erasure, so per Percival Everett's right. Erasure, Claudia Rankin's Citizen, Matt Johnson's right. um, uh, 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 Loving Day, right. uh, Paul White Beatty's Heads, Whitehead's Intuitionist, right. Paul Beatty's Slumberland. When right. you think about Slumberland, it's right. just one way to think about, well, right. is it really the case that then these 21st century experimental artists, are they really not asking the question, what will blackness be? I guess I would trouble that by even thinking about Paul Beatty, as I argue in the book, that Paul Beatty in Slumberland, he starts with that very declaration in this most satirical novel, right? Now that blackness is passe, I for one, the protagonist declares, I'm glad. Right. But we don't simply linger with the sense that blackness is dead. Right. We move by the end of the novel to what will blackness be, because we have then the protagonist in a jam session toward the end of the text, right? A jam session with the older musician who he feels is daring him to be black. Right. And this is, I think, such an interesting way to even go back to scat as the answer, right? right? right. The, the riffing, the improvisation is the only answer. What will blackness be is foregrounded in slumberland in perhaps a way that is not so different from an Amos Moore's right. poem to the hip generation. Are there connections being made, do you think, to contemporary black popular culture in that regard? 
<laughs> meaning, say, say more, meaning, you mean by the novelist or by the 21st century? Just in century? general, okay. like this okay. kind of sense of improvisation. I mean, okay. I, you know, I, in some ways, if I watch Atlanta, Right, right. Mm -hmm. I can see mm -hmm. actually Donald Glover playing with some right. of these aesthetics right. in ways because it's on, you know, his presentation of blackness is unsettling. Mm -hmm. Right, that's exactly mm -hmm. you know what you're mm -hmm. talking about throughout mm -hmm. the book. Folks who are committed to talking about blackness in ways that is unsettling right. and unsettled. Right. right? And right. the political project of blackness doesn't want to allow that. Right. Right. Which that's is why right. the black arts movement folks are so radical. Right. That's and right. the fact that Absolutely. they're in the midst of these struggles, right. but they're refusing to settle on this idea of what blackness is. No, that's right. So I think it happens when we think about what's happening right now in the popular zone. I think we need to as we continue to learn even from Richard Iden, we need to think about some of these illegible moments when we do have within the popular zone this focus on not only what will blackness be, but also a certain type of black counter public. So think for example, when Robin Roberts, right before the camera goes off, when she says, bye Felicia, as she thinks about Omaroso. Right. I think that's a moment when you right. see then right. the response right. by the black counter public to that moment right. when Robin Roberts simply says, bye Felicia, to right. Omaroso. I think there's a way that we then would also want, thinking about Richard Iden, to think about the fact that what we really see in terms of how the second wave of the black arts movement, how does it connect to the 21st century moment? I think what we really see is that Richard Iden, he gives us the theory that connects both moments, not uh, many of these other texts that are creating these space clearing um, 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 connections or, sp or space clearing gestures between the 1960s, um, 1960s and 70s and right now, the black fantastic is the glue. Yeah that connects then and now. Let's stay with Richard for a second. Um, mm -hmm. As we're taping this, it'll, it's close to a month away from the five year anniversary yes, yes. of his passing. Um, you know, Richard and I were close. We talked a great deal. Um, he is someone who would never have come on <laughs> Left of Black, because right? that, that just was not, you know, his style, right? Mm -hmm. That was his mm -hmm. affect. Um, but for audiences, and folks in the audience who don't really know Richard's work and his right. impact, can you talk a little right. bit about? Absolutely. You know. So Richard Iden's In Search of the Black Fantastic, I think it's, it's one of the most important texts in black studies, precisely because he's making us rethink how we feel the political. You know, where do we recognize it? You know, what is black resistance when we have to rethink that very category of how the political happens and how so often in black popular culture, and I would even say he enlarges what we mean by black, black popular culture, culture, which is why right. I want to choose the example right. of Robin Roberts, right. that moment when she says the bye Felicia. Right. But he's caring so deeply about the sense that there is a way in which black folks are deeply involved in the political even when it seems like we're shut out of it. I think that's what I would also right. emphasize, right? Yeah. You mentioned the late Mary Baraka earlier. Mm -hmm. um, as many of these folks have passed on and, and they're getting mm -hmm. on in their own age, how many of them did you get the chance to really sit down and kind of grapple with ideas with, right. like you did with Baraka? Absolutely. So Kalamu Ya Salam uh, was so Who's incredibly still here? helpful. <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> everything that I do with Black Art South and everything um, that I really um, wanted to do in terms of thinking about the Black Arts Movement in the South, so much of that, um, you know, really emerged out of many interviews uh, that I had with Kalamu Yasalam. Uh, Quo Vadis Gex, also located in New Orleans, was mm -hmm. also so um, incredibly helpful. Uh, Haki Matabuti, right. I've interviewed many times over the years. So absolutely, I think it really matters when we think about the archive to go deeper uh, simply by interviewing uh, many of the people yeah. who were deeply involved in the movement. Do you worry that there are a generation of young folks who don't know enough of some of these mm -hmm. figures? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned Haki, um, and I, you know, remember <laughs> the first time I read Earthquakes and Sunrise mm -hmm. Missions. Um, you know, I was an undergraduate in, in college, mm -hmm. um, and it blew my mind. <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and I'm not right. sure that young folks are having that kind of relationship with the mm -hmm. writers who came mm -hmm. one or two generations before them, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they might be having that moment with Brittany Cooper. Right. They might be right. having that moment with, with Ta-Nehisi Coates, mm -hmm. uh, with Darnell Moore, right? right? And it's all legit, right. 
right? Mm -hmm. Eve Ewing, right? Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. all legit. Um, mm -hmm. But have we done a good enough job, you know, whether it's in our role as professors or even in our community spaces to make right. sure that young people know Haki's generation, right? Or the generation right. that comes before Haki, right? right? You know, to really know how important mm -hmm. Gwendolyn Brooks was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as a writer. And then even to go further back to think about Harlem Renaissance folks right. like, like right. Bruce Nugent uh, or, right. or to, for folks who are not as well known. Right. right. No, I, I think absolutely. I think that one reason why it's important, you know, to really show these deep connections in terms of black right. experimental impulses shaping the black arts movement and the current moment. One reason why we need this alternative timeline for black experimentalism is indeed to help people read more, to actually mm -hmm. realize that what they think is so brand new about black abstraction or even right. satire um, as well, or even um, the very sense of this opening up this more capacious blackness that I think for many artists or many people feels like it is something that is simply tied to our current moment. If we, if we read um, the black arts movement more closely, if we read many of these texts that are out of print, right, in particular, not just fetishizing right, the more known right, black right, arts right, movement right, texts, right. I do think um, there's something valuable that happens. We actually realize that um, there are so many ways in which then the experimentalism, right, that's happening right now, it's, it's such a profound, larger legacy. There's a way in which we don't even understand uh, some of the um, dialogues right. that are actually happening the between, conversation right, point. between you know, um, the current text and right. these earlier texts. I mean, the fact that there are folks now, you know, there's a touring production of um, Langston Hughes' jazz piece. Right, um, right. And to read as you, you know, explore in the book the history of that, you know, mm -hmm. him being mm -hmm. in Newport and right. feeling as though the music was being dismissed mm -hmm. <laughs> and going mm -hmm. back to his hotel and just right. basically writing a manif manifesto for, right. for, for what black mm -hmm. music is, mm -hmm. right? And this is 1961. Right. He could have just as easily done that mm -hmm. yesterday and, right. and we'd be grappling with the same kind of issues. No, absolutely. And it's, you know, ask your mama when you think about that text and I think so many other texts written by Hughes, I think it's fascinating to actually think about that text as edge of the black arts movement. So right. back to anticipation, how Hughes right. is literally anticipating right. What's so much What's right. that happens right. in the black arts movement. Yeah. 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 Were there anything in terms of, of this work that surprised you? Um, stuff that kind of went against you, what your expectations were that you were going to find? You know, I, I would say, there, there were many surprises, but one surprise um, that I uh, think uh, was perhaps um, one of the biggest ones. Um, the letters that I found uh, between Carolyn Rogers and Hoyt Fuller and yeah. the way that as they became such deep friends, the ways in which they were so aware um, of some of the, um, some of the limitations of the rhetoric during the movement, some of the ways in which they were, in terms of this notion of black post-blackness, they were often that close to feeling pure exhaustion with the movement. But the surprise was the fact that they remained, and this is what you see performed in the letters, they remained so tied to the movement, even as they were that exhausted and frustrated with so many parts of people's inability to stay committed or the contradictions when people were uh, then uh, talking the talk but not actually practicing right, the solidarity and so forth. So the surprise was to see how even as the movement was unfolding and especially in what I'm calling the second wave of this movement, right, that the uh, letters show how their frustration and exhaustion did not lead to, to some kind of abandonment of the movement right. but rather this complicated way, right, that they were able to process all of that and remain that exhausted and continue to have this deep, deep commitment to this fragile movement. Uh, so uh, I would say that, you know, the nature of that surprise matters as we also think about some of the work that we still need to do on this movement. When we think about Hoyt Fuller as one of the veritable architects of this movement. Who not enough for you folks, I mean, he's mentoring Carolyn Rogers. Absolutely. He's mentoring Hakeem Abudi. Yes, like, right. yes. And so it's so, I think, important to think about 
those letters and the surprises we find in those letters as a way of understanding how even someone like Hoyt Fuller, right, he's at the center of this movement and he is also that exhausted with this movement at the same time. And as we know, you know, that's interesting to think about how sometimes when we're romanticizing these, the movement um, itself, we don't realize how people are sometimes s centered in the movement and beyond it as well. Another way of thinking is, is, as I'm proposing, that they were always anticipating what's that next step. What's next for you? I know you have an essay that's going to be coming out soon on Ask Your Mama. <laughs> yes, yes, that, that is true. And I also have another book project, of course, as you know, um, we must, in terms of this mission of black studies, we must keep it in motion, right? right. And so the next book is What is African American Literature? I'm thinking about um, how African American literature uh, can be understood as the textual production of black affect. So one part of this book is literally thinking about what does it mean to think um, seriously about moments, for example, like Toni Morrison's um, final passage in jazz, when she says, look where your hands are now, to think about the textual production of black affect, to think also in the same book, what is African American literature about the diasporic tensions that are really interesting right now in particular when we think about how there's the idea of African literature and the idea of African American literature rubbing against each other as writers really break the boundaries, right. especially some African women writers. Like a DJ. That's yeah. right, right, really breaking the boundaries between what we consider African literature and African American literature. So I'm also in what is African American literature thinking about the is in terms of the contemporary. How is it that we have a constant, you know, throughout the decade, so to speak, a constant performance of the contemporary, the sense that it's not simply 21st century African American literature as the what is, you know, that this is the contemporary, but the fact that there's a restaging of um, this notion of the contemporary throughout yeah. the decades becomes, yeah. that, that also becomes the meaning of African American literature. A response in part to Ken Warren? Absolutely, right? So as opposed to <laughs> Kenneth Warren's uh, what was, I want to move to what is. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Quick question. Is Black Panther post-black, uh, black post-blackness? I think it is because I think Black Panther is doing so many things, but I'm most interested in how it is so tied to the reinvention of blackness. And I think that's what black post-blackness is signaling, right? Mm -hmm. That it's blackness is always about that steady reinvention. And I think that when we think about the deeper work that Black Panther is doing, right? Wakanda is showing us the power of the black fantastic as the power of that impulse to constantly, constantly reinvent blackness. We've been talking with Professor Margot Natalie Crawford, professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, author of the new book, Black Post-Blackness, the Black Arts Movement and 21st Century Aesthetics at Woodview University of Illinois Press. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for joining us, Margo. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We 